The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. When reconciling, the truth is paramount. And as painful as it may be, it's necessary for healing. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Tonight, we kick off a special summer series looking back at some of the most important and notable stories we've covered on the agenda. We return to our conversations with Justice Murray Sinclair before and after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission he led. It's always important to look back in order to move forward. As we look toward a new normal, we wanted to go back into the TVO archives and share some of the discussions that shaped our discourse. This week, we consider reconciliation. And it's important to remember that there are more than 600 nations in Canada. Each nation identifies as a distinct group with different and unique histories. Of the nearly 38 million people who live in Canada, Almost 1.7 million identify as Indigenous. Indigenous peoples are the fastest growing population in Canada. The revelations of unmarked graves at former residential schools this year point all of us back to Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or the TRC. The TRC ran from 2008 to 2015, and a report was released with 94 calls to action. Tonight, we'll look back at two conversations with Justice Murray Sinclair. The first is from 2011. Our second interview with Justice Sinclair was a decade later, and it shows that we have a long way to go in meeting the 94 calls to action. I want to start because we're going to have a wide-ranging discussion here over the next 20 minutes or so on uh, a range of issues related to your commission. But I want to start by playing a piece of tape that was no doubt one of the most significant moments in the history of this country. Here's the Prime Minister of the country almost two years ago in the House of Commons. Roll tape, please, Michael. Two primary objectives of the residential school system were to remove and isolate children from the influence of their home, families, traditions, and cultures, and to assimilate them into the dominant culture. These objectives were based on the assumption that Aboriginal cultures and spiritual beliefs were inferior and unequal. Indeed, some saw it, as was infamously said, to kill the Indian in the child. We now recognize that it was wrong to separate children from rich and vibrant cultures and traditions, that it created a void in many lives and communities, and we apologize for having done this. In the almost two years since that apology was made, what do you think Aboriginal people have taken from that? Well, I think the um, apology itself was a, a, a momentous moment in the lives of the survivors, particularly. I think the Aboriginal communities generally, and for Canadians as well. It was a recognition of the wrongs of the past, the fact that, that what was done and what was intended to be done was unacceptable. Uh, so I think it was very important. I know that there were many uh, survivors in particular, survivors are those who went to the residential schools and had been there as students. I know that many of them were very uh, uh, impacted by the, uh, the hearing of the apology because for them it was finally a recognition that what they had been saying all along was right and it was finally a sense of validation about it. But at the same time, for many of them it was just the beginning. It was the beginning of a process in which they now are trying to come to terms with the fact that the anger about the, uh, the secrecy of it is behind them. Well, enter Judge Sinclair. You, uh, you're, you're part of that process, and I think most people are certainly aware of and remember this apology. It got a great deal of coverage. Something that got a lot less coverage is the work that you're doing. You're the chair of this Truth and Reconciliation Commission. What's your mandate? Well, our mandate is in the name, Truth and Reconciliation, and uh, there are components to that that we all uh, have to try to uh, bring forward to the public. The truth component is for us to essentially um, discover what really went on in the residential schools. And to do that, we document the experiences and the stories of the survivors. We uh, collect all of the materials uh, written and otherwise that are available about that, uh, that experience. Uh, we're, we are 
entitled to receive copies of all of the documents in the possession of the churches who ran the schools and the government who funded them to uh, take a look at what was going on internally within their communications. And, and then at the same time to do research, to fill in the gaps of our knowledge. And once we've done that, then we're obligated to file a report. How uh, much time you got for all that? Well, <clears throat> uh, the mandate of the commission was five years. Um, we have been given uh, appointments until 2014 to get that done. Uh, in addition to that, we have a process of uh, reconciliation that we also have to engage in, and that process involves informing the public about this, educating the public about residential schools, and asking the public to uh, accept that there are still more things that need to be done. The, the process you're undergoing, I suspect the best example people remember is the South African Truth and Reconciliation right. Commission. So could you compare what you're doing to what they did? South Africa's uh, commission was a very different kind of commission. Uh, they had different powers and different uh, uh, obligations that they were trying to achieve. Um, ours was um, similar in some respects. It, uh, certainly the fact that, that we're in search of the truth and we're in search of a way to bring people together is one thing. But we need to remember that there was a, um, a majority of people who were under the control of a minority of people in a South African situation. Here it was uh, a very... Um, distinct minority that was under the control of a majority of the population and majority government representing that population and so that's a distinct difference. The amount of violence in South Africa that accompanied the apartheid regime of course was well known and that was part of what they were trying to get at. And the opportunity to bring together the perpetrator and the victim of those acts of violence in South Africa was more um, uh, possible than it is in our situation because a lot of the acts of violence that occurred in the residential schools, the uh, acts of physical abuse and sexual abuse <coughs> are historical. Are dead, I guess. Uh, are historical. Yeah. Many of the perpetrators are either too old uh, to be held to account, uh, according to the government's prosecutors who looked at the files, or they've deceased and are no longer available. And some of the survivors, of course, have passed on mm -hmm. too. Part of your work, I gather, involves uh, mounting national, uh, for lack of a better expression. Um, well, what do we want to call them? Get-togethers. National, national events. National events. Okay, We're, we'll just call them that. And I, I want to show another piece of tape here from one that you did in your hometown of Winnipeg. I guess this was last year, last, almost a year ago. Our first national event. And this is the then Indian Affairs Minister Chuck Strahl listening to the story of one of the survivors. And it's, uh, you, I suspect people have not seen this tape before, so I'm really glad they're going to get to see it right now. Michael, if you would, roll tape. Thank you for for taking time to listen and I, I don't want to apologize for being emotional because we've been at this for 30 years. We've been asking to be heard for 30 years. We now have a voice. We can start breathing again. We can start living again. To make sure that we do everything we can to make sure that the record is complete, that we turn over every rock, to, that we make every, every supreme effort to make sure that we get that kind of information and that we work together so that we can, uh, that you can get some peace. Her hand on his back is just unbelievable. Wasn't that amazing? Talk to us about the importance of moments like that. Well, <clears throat> Minister Strahl, of course, was a leader in our community and at that time was the Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs. And his presence in the circle with the survivors who were speaking was an important gesture on his part um, and an important act. Uh, but in addition to that, it, um, I think this emphasizes what we've been saying all along and that, that is that Nobody who listens to the stories of the survivors cannot be impacted by it. You, you, you listen to what they say, not just uh, the, the acts that they suffered, but, uh, but the impact of the school on their lives, the fact that they were taken away as children, that they were placed in institutions. They were not allowed to see their parents. They were not allowed to see their brothers and sisters. They couldn't speak their language. They couldn't practice their culture. And then disbelieved for years. And then disbelieved for years. And, and all of that speaks to the fact that now they are being given the opportunity finally to talk about this in an open way, in a way that, uh, that validates them because now they're talking to each other as well as to the public. And so there, it's, a long, it's going to be a long process of, of healing. 
And circles like that, uh, that we've participated in with survivors across the country uh, and in the north, uh, have been an amazing experience for us as commissioners to listen to that. But at the same time, you can see the impact that they're having on the survivors. But what we really need to do is we need to ensure that Canadians hear those stories too, because we want Canadians to understand that this is not just an Aboriginal problem. This is a Canadian issue that needs to be addressed. The relationship between Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people in this country has been damaged by these schools. And part of that damage is not merely what happened to the students in the schools. That damage is also what happened to Canadians who went to their own schools and who were taught what they were taught, or not taught what they should have been taught about Aboriginal people in this country. Let me ask you to help us understand what the Missing Children Research Project, which is also part of your commission's work, what's that all about? One of the um, early discoveries from the research that was done at the startup of the commission was um, a recognition that there were a number of children who were sent to residential schools who never came home. They died at the schools. They died uh, perhaps from neglect, perhaps from abuse, perhaps when they ran away. Um, but they never, never came back home. And the survivors who, who did make it back home and their families have told us of the numbers. And we're, first of all, trying to get a handle on what those numbers are. So that's one of our research initiatives at this point in time. We do know that it runs into the thousands. It's much larger than I thought it was when I first took on this position. Uh, then the second question we have to ask ourselves is what happened to them? How did they die? Do we know that? And if we are able to determine that, then that may bring some peace to the families and the communities that they came from. And then the final issue is where are they? Where are they buried? Uh, and and what do the families know about where they're buried? And once they discover where they're buried, then are they able to uh, decide, make a decision as to what they want to do with that? Understandably, there may be some in the Aboriginal community who don't want to come forward and tell their story before the commission for a whole bunch of perfectly legitimate and understandable reasons. What would you say to them? One of the things that we've always said to survivors is that we understand if there's too much pain there for you to talk to us, and we accept that, and we're not forcibly telling people that they have an obligation to talk to us. But we do remind survivors that in the end result, after this is all over, and when they're no longer with us, that their family's going to always wonder what happened, what, what went on in those schools, what, what happened to my grandmother, my grandfather, or my auntie, my uncle. And if they ever want their family to find some peace and to understand, then they should help them. And we've encouraged survivors to come forward, and we've said to them, if you want us to hold your story from public knowledge or even from, uh, from your family's access to it until you're gone, we will respect that. We will protect that story as much as possible. But we want them to understand that the telling of the story will be very good for them. And in the long run, it'll be very good for their family and for their community, and we hope that they can understand that. And you started this conversation by saying, yes, this is something that Aboriginal communities across Canada will be understandably extremely interested in, but it's also important for non-Aboriginal communities to, to be connected to this as well. Because why? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> the one thing we remind uh, members of the public about is while they were teaching Aboriginal students in these schools that their cultures were inferior, their languages were inferior, and their historical existence was irrelevant. They were teaching the very same thing to non-Aboriginal children in a public school system. And so Canada has raised population upon population of people, generations now, of people have been raised with this particular attitude and information about Aboriginal people, which is just wrong. And what we need to understand is it's, the, it's this education system that got us into this situation where this relationship is so bad. And it's going to be the educational system that's going to get us out of it. We're going to have to look at ways of ensuring that children who are educated in the future, Aboriginal children and non-Aboriginal children, are educated fully, properly, and adequately about the residential schools and their impact on our society. You are more than five years away from the mandatory retirement age of 75 for a senator. And, you know, there's precious few of them who leave early. So how come you are? Well, um, it's time for me. Um, we all make these decisions based upon our individual factors and uh, whatever is important to us at the time. And, and I had no difficulty, really, uh, making this decision. In fact, when I was appointed to the Senate in uh, 2016, just after the TRC, um, at that uh, time when the TRC ended, I already made a commitment to my family and to the public that I was stepping back from public life. 
but I was persuaded by the Prime Minister and uh, others uh, to accept a position in the Senate. And I said both to myself and to others, uh, I'm going to do this for five years, and then I'm going to consider my situation at that time. So after five years, uh, we're, we're approaching that uh, in the springtime, I thought uh, uh, it's probably time because the, the pandemic has kind of sped things up for us. And, uh, and also there are other factors that have gone into consideration. Uh, do you want to amplify on that at all? Well, the workload is uh, uh, very heavy for me. Uh, I not only, of course, have my Senate duties, but I also have uh, public speaking demands that are imposed upon me or asked of me, and I, I gladly do them. Uh, in addition to that, as uh, you may know, I've undertaken to write a memoir, and uh, that's very time consuming. And I always wanted to go back to uh, uh, mentor young law students, particularly young Indigenous law students, about what it what it's like and what it means to be an Indigenous lawyer in this day and age, so that they can be proper role models for those who are following behind them. And so all of that uh, are all important objectives for me. And um, uh, I thought uh, the, the latter ones were becoming more and more significant. In addition to that, of course, there's also my family, my family's demands and, and expectations as well. And with the uh, pandemic, uh, I've spent more time with my family, with my uh, my children, my wife, and uh, her medical needs are, are also quite uh, significant. She has a, she's in an immune compromised situation. And uh, every time I would go out in the public, it would be a, a possible danger to her. So I didn't want to enhance that in any way. I'm sorry to hear about that. Didn't know that. I'd like to get your take on the very strange year in which we live. 2020 uh, has, you know, it, it's been a triple threat in some respects, not only COVID-19, but of course the economic dislocation for many that has come with it. And beyond that, the kind of racial reckoning that has taken place across North America for uh, so-called BIPOC people, black, indigenous, and people of color. And I know some people have been mortified at what they have seen when they have seen demonstrations in the streets, and other people have been quite encouraged by it all. Uh, how do you regard it? Uh, well, I think it's an important conversation for us to have, and, and the, the demonstrations and the protests that we see are really a reflection of uh, uh, the undercurrent of racism that is, is at play within many of our institutions and systems. Uh, people who are protesting against police action, for example, are not doing it because they dislike police. They're doing it because they dislike the way that police are policing. And uh, the same is, is true with our other institutions in society as well. Uh, we see protests against uh, political decision-making activities. We see protests against uh, politicians. And, and it is because of the, the things that they say and what uh, they stand for and their unconscious racism and bias that um, they need to be held to account and they are being held to account. So I think that we're not through with that conversation yet. I think there are some systemic and institutional changes that still need to occur. But I think generally the direction in which our society is going uh, is going to be a good direction because we are now engaged in a dialogue about things like uh, cultural genocide, um, historical genocide, uh, systemic racism, systemic bias, systemic discrimination. And when we uh, weren't in discussion about those things before, to the extent that uh, often we didn't understand what it was that we were talking about when those terms were being used. You actually got us on the road to that conversation several years ago with your 94 calls to action when you chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. <laughs> How far down the road of seeing those 94 calls to action actually implemented do you think we are today? Well, and there are some significant changes that have occurred within the, the educational system that uh, I think are, are very good. Um, we have seen attempts on the part of the curriculum uh, program teams to uh, change the curriculum so that it properly reflects uh, the, the true history of this country, uh, but does it in a contextual way so that people understand why things were being done at that particular point in time and that it isn't solely 
uh, uh, just a, a bad thing only because it was a bad thing. The reasons why bad things happen, and it's only when we understand why those reasons uh, influence that direction that we will be able to prevent them from occurring again. And that's what's important. And we are we are learning that. We are learning about that. And we still have a ways to go. Um, our educational systems have not all embraced curriculum change. Uh, and we, we have seen, in fact, that there have been uh, various provinces and uh, places within Canada that have pushed against uh, making curriculum changes. They like the way the story has been told in the past and the way the story will continue to be told. Um, but we're ch seeing changes in the media, the degree to which stories are covered now in the media, and that in the language that the media uses, uh, I think is much different than it was before. Uh, I've been invited to speak at uh, church congregation meetings uh, that want to talk about how churches can change the way that they do business and how they can converse about this, and I think that's a significant improvement. Uh, I've been invited to corporate uh, events uh, to speak to corporations about how they can uh, go about doing their business internally within their operations, but also how they can partner with uh, Indigenous communities better than they have in the past. Hmm. One aspect of this racial reckoning that has been particularly controversial is what we do about the so-called old white men who founded this country 150 plus years ago. Uh, we have seen in Montreal Johnny McDonald's statue being toppled and the head falling off. We have seen in Kingston, his hometown, uh, Queen's University take his name off uh, the law school there. Um, you are one of the few Indigenous leaders, if I can put it this way, who has said uh, we actually don't have to eliminate Sir John A.'s name from our country, um, but we don't have to topple the statues. We don't have to have status quo either. You've wanted to look for a third way. Could you tell us if you think that third way is still available to this country? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is quite uh, available to us. And in fact, uh, from uh, the perspective of reconciliation, I think it's, it's probably the, the, the more comfortable way to go. Having said that, um, let me be clear that um, there are elements within our historical um, system, there are books within our histories uh, that have extolled the virtues of people like Sir John A. Macdonald, and he's not the only one, um, who deliberately set out to do wrong to people of color. And uh, we have ignored that fact historically to the extent that we don't even realize now that uh, he did and said those kinds of things. Uh, we don't we don't know, for example, and we're not taught that Sir John A. Macdonald uh, was one of the first people in Canada to use the term uh, Aryan race, that he believed that people of Aryan race should be the only ones to come to Canada and immigrate here. And uh, with the uh, rise of the Nazi party in Germany in the 1940s, we came to see uh, the viciousness by which that could become the rule of behavior in this country. And so we need to guard against that. We need to ensure that that kind of language is not part of our uh, vernacular here in this country. But um, we also need to ensure that when our children are growing up, that they learn the full history of the country. They know everybody who did everything. And what I've said in the past is that my preference would be that we tell the truthful story about these historical figures. Um, we stop extolling them as simply virtuous people, uh, that we put them into a proper context, and that we at the same time should uh, have a um, parallel or similar system put in place for uh, the historical figures of other um, races and other cultures as well. Having said that, do you think more people get it now? Well, I think so. I think we're now having conversations that we never had even two or three years ago. Um, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement has, has raised the, the dialogue, um, not necessarily the level of agreement, but it's raised the dialogue around the impact that decisions have upon the lives of people um, of color in this country and in the United States. Um, and, you know, and the expression always is that um, in North America um, is, is a place where people of color uh, fear going out at night, not because other people of color might harm them, but people who are not of color might harm them. In our last couple of minutes here, I just want to read something that um, 
Well, I think you know this fellow pretty well. Uh, his name is Negan Sinclair, and he wrote an op-ed piece in the Winnipeg Free Press last week in which he wrote, while he did different monumental work in his career, my lasting image of him standing up for our people, no matter the odds, has never left. From his time working in, frankly, racist institutions as a first, to starting new paths where our cultures and communities can forge our own paths, my father's journey has remained resoundingly consistent. His success, found via his commitment to words, stories, and peaceful, reasoned dialogue as a method for change, is his life achievement and will be his lasting legacy. When a father reads those words written by a son, how does he feel about that? Well, it was um, tremendously emotional to read them. Um, and my wife and I both had tears in our eyes when we, when we uh, read what he said and then he published it you know, before he showed it to us. So it's not like he sought our permission ahead of time, uh, <clears throat> which he didn't have to do, but um, it, I thought it was very touching, and it uh, just goes to show that you know, one of the legacies that I think we all should strive for is to uh, to have children like that, who speak like that, not just about uh, their parents, but about the role of parenting overall. Uh, and he's a, he's a good father to his daughter, and uh, he will be a good uncle to his nephews and nieces. And uh, others that I know of who are now growing up in this day and age uh, have examples like perhaps mine, but others as well, to see what it means uh, to be uh, patient, to persevere against uh, hatred and discrimination and actions that are not acceptable, uh, to be courageous and to strive to be wise and to learn how to apply all of that in a way that is not harmful to others. Well, Senator Sinclair, I guess I'd finally just say, get to work on those memoirs, because we look forward to having you back here to talk about those. <laughs> yeah, well, every time I end up staying up uh, half the night writing them, I keep reminding myself, this is important. I better get to, to bed so I can finish it <laughs> And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. Tomorrow, we look back on arguments about what to do about the federal legislation known as the Indian Act. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit TVO.org daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, read Steve Pakin's articles, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash daily. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.